Captain Jade along with my buddy Judy, and uh, we have some updates in regards to what Boris was talking about in regards to the IRS and your deceased status. And I wanted uh, Judy to come on and share her story, and I'll also share my story. So, hello, Judy. How are you? Oh, fine. Hi. Thank you so much for being on the air with us because I thought your story, when you shared it with me, um, just as a background for those who have listened to uh, Endgame with Boris, he was talking about how you have a birth certificate and a driver's license and a Social Security, and an infant should be able uh, to get those and become alive in the system and not deceased. However, the IRS is collecting a death index, and why they have um, us or our social or our vessel or our trust or our estate down as deceased is because they want to have us pay for the TOD, which is a transfer on death tax. So if you find out somehow that this entity, your all capital name, uh, is deceased within the system, that's very good because you could uh, utilize that information to get out of a bind with regards to court cases because you should really be in a probate court and you should have an appointed executor. But this is a, a twist and a turn as we get deeper down the rabbit hole. So go ahead, Judy, and share your story of what exactly happened when you went to visit the IRS. Okay, I heard Boris tell his story about this, uh, you know, death uh, that were deceased. And so I like to try things. So my, I have an IRS office, a two-man local uh, IRS office, very small. But I've been there before, and so I gathered the documents that Boris mentioned, and I drove over there. And uh, I didn't have to wait or anything, and uh, I went in and talked to one of the gentlemen. And uh, I says, I, I would like you to check and see what my status is uh, on the uh, in your records there. So he. So Judy, he what what IRS office was this? What state are you on? Uh, I'm in Western Wisconsin. Okay. And it's, it's just a real small where they help you with taxes and everything. They don't do much there, but there's usually two men there, and it's got a, an armed guard, and that's about it. But um, so I went in, and, and uh, I asked him to look up the status. He asked for me to enter my Social Security number in his little machine. And, oh, and by the way, I want to tell you, I noticed that they have a recorder there on the desk, so they're recording everything you're saying when you're Really? There. I didn't know that. Yeah. Well, I, I noticed. That's that kind of good, you know, uh, yeah. invoke a court of record right away. <laughs> Yeah, I noticed it there, and I says, "Oh, uh, are you? Re is this a recorder?" And he said, "Yes." And I says, "Oh, well, I, I think I asked him about it." And he said, "We just do it for to check our quality, quality assurance, or something like that." And I, I anyway, uh, I had checked. I, I knew that before, so you can see it on the desk if you if you look, you'll see the little device. But anyway, um, so you so were going into the IRS building to try to find out whether or not this account, Social Security account, is labeled as a deceased. Go ahead with your story. Yes. So uh, he takes my Social Security number and he pulls it up on a screen and he's looking at the screen, which is facing so I cannot see it, you know, and he's looking. I'm just seeing him looking and looking. And, and he says he says something like, hmm. Interesting. Or, hmm. What What was your question to them? Could you look up the social to find out if there's any what? Uh, I asked him if he could look up my uh, yeah my my account to see if if uh, what status Okay, you kind of cut out for a second. And, did uh, you say Did I you say I look up your? I wanted to see if it was deceased or alive. Okay. I apologize, folks, because Judy, you know, she's we're on this Internet and the connection isn't very good. So I kind of got the end. But she asked for whether or not the status was deceased or alive. Go ahead, Judy. Yes. So he's looking at the screen and he makes some 
uh, some some kind of facial expression or says hmm, and then he says it it says it looks like it's deceased. Yeah, <laughs> I was I was shocked. He was I shocked, was and you were shocked, right? Yeah. Well, he acted like he was shocked, and I was uh, stunned myself because I didn't expect it to be that way. And he said, "Oh, he said something like there must be a mistake." And right. And I says, oh, well, can it be corrected? And he said, well, yes, but uh, we can't do that here. We have to mail in uh, uh, paperwork to the office to headquarters or something like that. And he said, I'll need your driver's, a copy of your driver's license, uh, your Social Security card, and I think he said birth certificate. Because I, anyway, I had all these with me. I took them there because I was prepared for this. And so he said, so bring those in sometime. And I said, well, I have them right here. <laughs> and he said, oh, okay, well, let me have <laughs> Ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> I think he was shocked. And so he takes them back in the back room and makes copies. And I waited there. And then he comes out and hands them back to me. And I says, oh, uh, well, can you print out something that you've changed this? Or can you give me evidence of some kind? He said, no, I can't do that. And I says, well, can I have copies of what you just printed or what you just copied? And he said, yeah, I can do that. So he, he gave me two pages of uh, copies and he put a file, his file stamp on each one of them. So it's like, you know, it's like proof, evidence. Right. <clears throat> the stamp from the IRS is like they received the documents and it has the date and they don't sign it, but it just says, you know, like deposit or accept it or something i can't remember yeah i, I can't remember either but it, it was just like taking it to court because it was a file you know a stamp they put on it <laughs> yeah and just to read back the irs manual is 21.7.13.3.2.2 an infant is the decedent of an estate or grantor owner or trustor of a trust guardianship receivership or custodian that has not yet received a social security number. So if you have a social security, you obviously can't be the infant or the decedent. Okay. Okay, so I got my copy of what he had copied. And uh, let's see, I think that was the end of that visit. Uh, I asked, will they, will, will they be sending anything to me? And he said, no, I don't think, no, they won't, they won't be writing to you. And I, I was like, I wanted some evidence that they changed it, but he wasn't about to tell me or give me anything. And uh, at one point in the visit, I asked if I could see his screen to see the writing on it. He says, he just said, no. <laughs> right, that's highly confidential. They want to pretend as if that's highly confidential that the Social Security has been dis uh, assigned a decedent or deceased status. And... Um, you know, that's kind of damning because you've been paying all this time for transfer on death tax for yeah. them. Everything is a TOD, transfer on death tax. Well, I, I went back a second time. Uh, let's see well, let me, uh, let me ask you, in that meeting, did you bring up the IRS code at all? Um, I don't think, I don't think I did. I don't think I brought it up. I was okay, good. I was acting stupid, you know. That's just, exactly right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, anyway, he was uh, the guy. The other guy came over because he wasn't busy, and they were like both like talking to me, and I was asking for evidence, and they weren't they weren't going to give me anything except the copies. So I thought, well, uh, I said, well, how will I know if it's changed? And he said, well, it'll just be changed, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> they don't care what you get. So. Uh, I went back a week or two later, and I went in, and uh, he recognized me, and I says, I wanted to just check on the status of my account. So he pulls it up again, and he looks at it, and he says, yeah, it's been changed. And I Was said, that like a week later, Judy? Yeah, it was like a week later, because I had asked how long it would take, and he said, oh, well, we just have to mail it in, and it won't take too long. It, they, they do it at the, at the uh he didn't say where. I didn't ask where, but he, they they could not do it on the computer where right. at that office. So anyway, he said yes, it's changed, and I says 
well, can I have a printout of that or some evidence that it's changed? I'd like to have something to, to show that. And he said, no, I can't give you that. I can't give you anything. And I says, well, how do I know that it's been changed? And he says, well, and he started getting gruff with me. He says, well, you can just write down my name and my badge number and said that say that and say that I told you on this date that it was changed. So he was asking you to make your own record for the IRS and put his name and his ID down that you spoke with him. Wow. Yeah, he was not going to give me anything in writing at all. Uh, So I had to, I did, I said, okay, I'll I'll do that, and I wrote it down, and that was pretty much it. Uh, Right. Wait. We wanted to have, like, when you listen to Jaguar speak, and we have, on the website, you know, his platinum party, and then there's a birth, there's a death certificate information video that you can listen to. That's very relevant because the system, the way you're going to get a payout is actually you have one side, which is deceased, and one side that is alive. So Mm -hmm. I thought that the avenue would be easier if I found out from the IRS that there was some form of deceased code which in the IRS IMF manual, they would put the code TC540, which leads me to my next story about what I did. And the story goes like this. I wanted to have the deceased status on my file. That's what I wanted. It would resolve a lot of different issues, including the fact that I didn't have to make a death certificate to get a payout. So I did a FOIA request to, uh, I believe it was Atlanta IRS main office for FOIA request. And that's done under 5 USC 552 and a couple other ones. And I wanted the IRS to produce the deceased status for this Social Security all capital name. And within 30 days, yes, they did respond. They said, yes, we've checked all of our files. We don't see the TC540, which is deceased, file, and we don't see anything that that indicates that you are deceased. They kept saying, you, 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 and they they wrote their letter and not include the Social Security account number. Okay, so I have to respond to them and, and get that updated. Then on the call that I did with Peter on January 22nd, I also talked about the Social Security Administration has a DMF, which means death master file. Death master file is also the avenue for the Social Security Administration to locate the decedent of an estate. So I sent another FOIA, and so did Judy this past week, and we're just waiting for the response from the Social Security Administration. They do tell you, however, that if you don't like their answer, you could appeal it. And FYI, (laughs) if you appeal it, they're not going to go anywhere. They're just going to deny you. I have a feeling, (laughs) funny suspicion, that the reason why they don't want to tell you uh, that you're deceased on paper is because it would implicate them on the fact that they've been collecting your credit which is once a decedent exists and the cargo goes overboard at Admiralty, then what happens is that they do a, um, I want to say in Admiralty, uh, now I lost the word, but basically they got you as the all capital name down uh, as a surety for the transaction to pay for the taxes, either as an executor or as a trustee. But an executor doesn't always necessarily pay the taxes on a transaction, but he is responsible to pay any taxes if the accounting is correct. And if you want to know about that, please go and check out Canon Law for the Vatican under Executors. And if an executor is presented with any documents that are correct, all the accounting is correct, he must settle immediately. However, if there's any anomalies in the records and there's fraud involved, he cannot settle. And that's something very important, canon law, to know when you're dealing with the court because everything is actually a fraud. Um, For the most part, everything is a fraud, unless there's some anomalies that you found out about your records. 
So this is very exciting. Um, I, wanted I, to, I wanted to tell you about my letter after you had your results from uh, the Social Security. Let's see, was it IRS that responded that way uh, to your letter about the uh, It was disease? the IRS, and they said I was never a disease within the system. I, I, I should say not I, but the account number. There's a difference here. When I come out as a live woman, I'm either as a general executrix or as the live heir beneficiary, and there's a difference. There's a separation, whereas with Boris's style of doing things, it's all warped into one, which is you've assigned me this social, I'm going to use it, even though that's a separate account, that's not me, but I'm just going to use the number. I kind of stay away well, from warping I, everything yeah, into one. I, uh -huh. Well, I, I adjusted my letter to, the, to both the IRS and the Social Security based on your experience, and I said, I referenced, please give me the status of this account with this uh, account number, and I said, in your letter, please uh, send a signed letter as evidence, let's see, legal evidence of the status of whether it's alive, this account is alive. Yeah, this or dead, and include it. the social security number in your letter. <laughs> yeah, we kind of lost yeah, you the, when the, you were saying that, but what Judy was saying was that she edited the FOIA request to say, please sign it and make sure that you indicate whether live or dead, and what you want to say is that for that account, because they're just going to reference, even if you write to the Bureau of Public Debt, they're going to just say you, 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 and not identify as a separation with the all capital name. And they write your name differently as well. They could put the first name, middle name, last name in all caps. They can put the uh, last name, comma, middle name, first name. They can identify you in the upper and lower case name. And when I got back from uh, dealing with the Homeland Security for my alien file, they were writing everything in the upper and lower case name, and so did the IRS. There's a distinction between those names. That is not the account designation name, and they're trying to, you know, kind of mess with you. So when you're indicating the account, you can write, you know, upper all uppercase name account or last name, comma, middle name, first name, all uppercase, any derivatives thereof, like you need to include that so that when you're creating your estate paperwork, you identify the correct account number so you could do those claims. And Judy was asking me, well, what do you do now because you're alive? And I said, you know, we could take anything that they write to us on letterhead and put together an affidavit and claim that to the estate as an asset. So what we're doing every time we're claiming something is it, it's like it's floating. The cargo is floating out there in the ocean, but we got to put a net in and then grab it in like a fish and put it onto our vessel, and that's our estate or our trust. That's why it's important before you endeavor to set up your estate and everything, it's best to try to find out what the government is naming you, all of the variations of your name, and get as much record as you can so that you can claim that for the estate. And eventually, when you get to the audio call pertaining to Jaguar and what the political subdivision Platinum Party is doing, once you get the oath for your hood and your insurance for your hood, that means all the politicians that run the alleged government uh, NGO, which is, let's say you're living in um, a city, city of, well, you see the word of, that's NGO, and that's all fake government. So you need to get their oath, their bonds, certified copies if you can, and also their underwriter for their insurance because it's the insurance and the reinsurance that they're really going after um, when it pertains to risk management and your funds. That's why we're kind of, you know, this Thursday coming up, this Thursday, we're going to have a call 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. with Jaguar and then three other calls on Thursdays following that. And we're going to be talking about your accounts, your surplus funds, and what this all means, you know, as it pertains to becoming free again 
and getting your estate set up. Does that make sense, Judy? Yes, and I, you reminded me of some things. One of my uh, utility bills, a uh, phone bill, was coming with my last name first on the bill. I notice how they style it differently on different accounts. So what you're saying is interesting because I always wondered, why are they putting my last name first? On right. this? It means, yeah, well, the first name um, could mean the county and the city, and the last name means the state. So when they put it in reverse, they're identifying accounts that they're going to, who's going to be leeching off your money. But at the end of the day, <laughs> yeah, at the end of the day, what's happening is that they're c collecting funds from the controller and it's rolling into the county, let's say county directors or whoever that is a top financial person at the county. And you can find that out in the CAFR report. And then from there, the funds, your funds, get transferred to the city where they are uh, collecting heads of chattel and residents. So the payout exists for them with the resident status, which mm -hmm. identifies, could be identified, let's say, when you go and get a driver's license. They always ask, well, where's your, you know, where do, where's your residence? Mm -hmm. Or when you get a voter's registration, they want to know, or when you get a bank account, they want to know where you live. Because that's, at the end of the day, that's the payout agent. So the county is a payout agent and the city is a payout agent. And who's in charge of the city? Well, usually that's the mayor. And then you've got to find the um, uh, whoever that's in charge of the accounting. And that's what we're, try we're trying to do, irregardless of whether or not you want to join with doing what the political subdivision Platinum Party Jaguars group is doing. You still need to have that in your arsenal as an acceptance to their oath and their bonds. That becomes now your bond. I wanted to tell you, I was able to get, uh, I, I thought that it was important to go back to the birth county to get this before I'd heard this uh, recent yes, that's it. That is incorrect. A lot of the notion about birth county, there's relevance to where it was set up, and we call that the issue agent. And that would be the birth hospital as well as vital statistic for the state that you're born in. But at the end of the day, where your money goes is where you actually reside as a residence in. Okay. Okay, but, but what was important? What was what happened? That was uh, was quite an experience for me. Is it's a very big county where I was born, and I contacted the county recorder there, mm -hmm. uh, and I asked to have a copy of his oath and bond. And usually when I've done this kind of thing, you get a lot of resistance and a lot of why do you want it and all of that. And he didn't do any of that. He said, oh, all I need to do is go upstairs and, and get a copy of the bond and then go to the drawer and get, get a copy of the oath. And I, I can scan them and send them to you without any questions asked. Well, and so who are you doing that for? Who were, Was that the birth hospital or the county that you lived in? As you that was the, ca the ca county I was born in. and. Right. Uh, you know, at one time I was thinking of recording some documents in my birth county just to have it close to where my record, vital records are originated. And so that's why I was doing the county recorder. But his response to me, I says, I've never been treated so well by a public official. And he, he just laughed and he says, I know my role. I know I'm a public servant and I, I don't question things. I, I, I know that that's my job. So I was. I'm How telling many you, years back was that? Last year. Wow, last year. That's pretty amazing. Yes, he was very, uh, very kind and very. He did not ask me why once at all. He just, for I didn't ask for certified though. But right, was, I I just called up my city where I currently uh, exist on, and I was asking, well, I'd like to have a certified copy of the mayor's oath and his bond, and she yeah. says. I'm sorry, we only have a, a copy of that that we can email to you. And I said, what? Where Where do they uh, do the repository for the county? Uh, is it at the county where I could get a certified copy? She says, actually, no. He, the mayor takes his oath with the, count, uh, with the uh, city clerk. And the city clerk has a, has a copy for all of us to give out. 
I said, really? So there's no re- recording anywhere of this event. She says, nope, just a city clerk, and she had to get off the phone right away. She says, I'll email you a copy of his oath. That's fine. I think you just need to, to keep on this, because if you go back and say, I just need to have this certified for legal evidence, something like that. Yeah, I, yeah. she says, do you want us to write something? I said, it's not authentic if you just send me a copy of that. I don't know. I could make up one myself, you know. But if you if you could just have the city clerk uh, identify that this is a true and correct copy to certify that, that would be wonderful. Uh, she had to get off the phone. So I, I do need to pursue that a little bit more, and I do need to go to the county and research out uh, these guys' bonds. And if they have insurance, uh, she really got scared when I was asking about the insurance and the bond. Um, but you need to ask for the insurance, the reinsurance. And you don't have to get certified copies of those, but we need to have the underwriter's name. Um, so that's why having being a part of the political subdivision from Canada coming in as you know a forensic auditor of some type with these county and saying, yeah, we'd like to invest a billion dollars in this city this is what we're requesting here and from there you know you'll probably be the first one in your county to be asking for that Um, so once we collect all that data and we put it we should have two sets of certified copies of anything that we collect and if not then we need to create the affidavit so that it can be apostilled and that's what we carry around with us. Once we claim it, once we claim their oath, their bond, and their insurance, why do you want to do that? Because it cre- it creates a massive indemnity bond. So collecting data from the IRS, collecting data from the Social Security Administration about your decedent account, and then going off to your local hood to locate all of the major players, oath, bond, insurance, and reinsurance, now you're in the game. You don't go and try to straighten out your estate without having the bond in place. That's what we're trying to get to. We're trying to get to an indemnity bond if that's where you want to take it. It's not a requirement, but if you accept any of their oaths and their bonds, now you become a party to it. It's just like a lot of people bring up, you know, the Constitution. Well, I have to ask you, did you ever accept the Constitution? Did you ever become a signatory to the Constitution? Okay, if you haven't, then you're not a player. So you can't go in a court and start bringing up the Constitution. It has nothing to do with you. I'll give you another example. When I was becoming a citizen of the United States of America, they gave me a certificate, and I took an oath to and allegiance to the United States of America. Well, if I never accepted my oath, which is the bond, and I never accepted my citizenship, then it's null and void. It doesn't exist for me to have standing in any of those laws. And further, I must say that the United States of America was not fully enacted properly under the Articles of Confederation and the Constitution, the word United States of America, the nation of United States of America. That's why the other uh, sovereign nation has established all those standings for their people, the sovereign nation of the United States of America. They don't want to be public at this present time because they're working on some more paperwork, but they... um, I've spoken to them several times, and they are at generalpost.org. Okay, they're the general post office, and generalpostoffice.org, and then you're going to be sent to a, a website that is a different nomenclature for them. But they are the true United States of America, the sovereign nation, and they have accepted the Articles of Confederation, and they have accepted the Constitution and have corrected that, and their documents are on script, uh, scribed for you to read. And um, you, you can be participants in that. You can realign with the correct republic, and they've been at this for a very long time. So they don't want to really go 
you know, too public, and they did it. They talked to me, and they said, you know, now is not a good time to go really public. But if you're looking for your common law rights in the courts, and you're not, you haven't taken an oath of allegiance to the correct nation that brought forward uh, the common law and also uh, the acceptance of the Articles of Confederation and Constitution for the people, and um, it, then then you don't have any standing, right? You don't, you cannot proceed on with your uh, whatever commerce that you're you're applying to the Constitution or your common law rights. Let me ask you, Judy, have you ever sworn an oath and allegiance to the United States of America? Not that I know of. Good. So when we know that, that becomes the bond. So the oath is the bond, which is why Jaguar keeps bringing up oath, bond, uh, insurance, and reinsurance. Okay? Those key components brings forward your ability to hold them accountable if you accept their oath, their bond, and their insurance, or have their underwriter insurance information in your file. That's why we need everybody on board, whether or not you're going to be a part of the surplus funds or not. If you're one day negotiating with these people at the county level for your payout, or, or the Queen of England or the Pope of Rome or a sovereign nation, wherever that you're landing, you better know this type of information because they all know it. And when they look down at you and they want, they want to negotiate with you, they, under HR 3474 that you've been listening to Cindy speak, well, Cynthia will tell you right off the bat that they're going to send you to the nut ward. That's their first, you know, uh, psychiatric evaluation, the net ward. That's their standard operating procedure for when you go looking for your funds. How are you going to protect yourself with a shield and go against these people who are, are nothing but cannibalists? You got you to gotta defend yourself and your position with what you know. Or do you know if you're dead or alive? Do you know if you have a status of being alive? Do you know that uh, whoever that is in your hood has an oath, license, and bond? Do you know if you have a bond or not? So when you're talking to them, they just have to look at a few things. Do you have an oath and a bond? Then we can talk. If you don't have those things, then we shouldn't be talking. That's why the political subdivision of Canada would have those type of mechanisms, and they just need you to go and collect a few pertinent data from your city and your county where you are residents, they're collecting your credits. But maybe we can do something about that. Who, who at the county is, who do we go to at oh, the county? That's a good question because when I was talking to my friends and I guess different uh, different cities have different organization or county, I'm sorry, have different organization, it would be located in the CAFR reports so what I did was I, for me, in my county, it's the director of finance who handles. He's, he's above, he's one notch in finance above the assessor's office. The assessor's office has to report to the director of finance. So he's, he's getting all the debits and credits at the end of the day, and he, he needs to make sure that all the credits are correct for his political subdivision heads county. Um, and then he collects that for the city. So it's not the county administrator, the one that is would be in charge of the county? No, no, no. I'm talking about a finance level, but there could be a government level that you're talking about. Like, I would get the oath, the assurance for the risk management and the coroner's office. Those are two key in the county that I need to get, right? The coroner identifies the decedent. He's the record keeper for the decedent, collecting credits on the decedent's estate. So you can't be a beneficiary if your estate is actually identified as a decedent. But you can be if you just say, yeah, I'm a, I'm a live heir beneficiary, and I'm here to collect with the decedent's estate. That could be a possibility. There aren't, there aren't many coroners left. They're, they're medical examiners, and they're not elected. Right. They're appointed. So Right. 
Yeah. And then you need to get the acts that gave rise to, let's say, the city being in place, the act that gave rise to the county being in place, the constitution for your state, if there's one or two, get a certified copy of that. Get a certified copy of anything that gave rise to, let's say, if you have a court case. Where, what authorized, let's say, the superior court or the supreme court within your state to exist or the presiding judges to exist, right? All those acts, you need to accept those acts to be a member of that, to be a party to that contract. Once you put your John Hancock on it and you sign across with a stamp and accept their oaths, their bonds, their insurance, their reinsurance, or their acts that gave rise to those entities, now you're playing with the big guys. That's why we're running around saying you're you're a public official. You need to, you need to do this and that. No, you, I'm sorry, you haven't done your due diligence, and you don't know where your standing is. I'm sorry, and, <laughs> and that's uh, why they treat us like in, in, infants. Just so you know, I, I was doing when I was doing re- research on uh, my the city I live in, I was able to find all the all of their acts and ordinances that they have passed at the Secretary of State's website. Like there's a place on there that has a, a repository for records for municipalities, whether it's a township or a city or whatever. And I was able to right. find all these old uh, or uh, whatever they voted for right. was posted on there. It's quite, quite. Uh, like yeah. my, my county, for example, they have something like a oper- not operating circular, but a um, it's like a. It's like articles of incorporation or however that they want to structure their business. Are they, and when you dig into those paperwork, some, some counties aren't set up like that. Okay, some are located in another county, in another county, or in another state. So when you start digging into how they were set up on, on their website, first thing, go to their website and try to find out where, you know, their organizational setup is and read all the documentation, um, if they're incorporated or not, you know, then you know that they're fictional. Most of them are, because just by the word, let's say, secretary of, or city of, or county of, that word of right in the middle tells you that they're they're a for-profit or private corporation, not necessarily the true uh, government. Okay, so it's like superior court of, uh, state of, you know, all those words of will identify that they're NGOs and they're really not government whatsoever. That's why we're dealing with them on a commercial basis, all right? When we ask for those identifiers, we're asking to deal with them on a commercial basis. Why are they controlling our vessel and our estate? What gives them the right to do that? Well, if you find out that you're deceased, that's a that's a red light going up right away. Because as a deceased, how can you come and claim anything, right? Mm-hmm. Well, I was able to find my city, the charter for my city and the articles yes. of incorporation at the Secretary of State. And it goes back to 1882 is, you know, how old wow. the, the the records that they had on there and so I was like amazed that I could find they I have- know that is amazing that she was able to find the articles of incorporation back to what 18 what 1882 it almost case. sounds like this when they formated the state or uh, a few years I afterwards yeah, it was probably just a, a an unincorporated town or something like that or a township and then they probably did the incorporation but it, to find these old records, somebody is the keeper of the records, and I have I I can find records of all kinds. I found the uh, governor the annual governor's meeting transcripts for the for right. every year back to like 1900, where they are discussing how they're going to uh, uh, you know work as governors, how they're going to change their governing their structure for their states, and so. I'm just saying that all of this is recorded, is typically recorded somewhere, and you just, you can find it if you just right. keep working. <laughs> and, and you're absolutely right, because uh, when I went to order the land patent at the BLM, I found out that they they had some weird records. So then I called up the Sacramento, you know, the capital, and there's a library over there, and they actually had 
even more records than the BLM. They have purchased some of the copies of the uh, land records um, before they were destroyed at the county level, but they don't have everybody's land patents or alluvial title records. And this goes back to Spanish-Mexican War in California. Um, and it's pretty amazing when you, you can locate that and get certified copies of the authentic, original, what they have put into the BLM records. Uh, it may be at your state uh, level library, like National Archives is another one for the federal level. And, well, um, my, I was I uh, was very interested in the land patents. So I my the city I live in is about fifteen thousand population. It's not very big, but I actually pulled the land patents for the, all the land in the city, and so I have a folder with all the land patents for the whole city municipality, right. just as an exercise. Right. Because and then I've spent hours down at the Register of Deeds office trying to learn the lay of the land there and the records. I looked in the old books and pull off the shelf yet to look at the old deeds and the mortgages. It's quite interesting. It you is. A lot. You do. But in my county, it's like you, there's no other separate room where you go and research stuff. They got everything in microfiche, and if you don't exactly have the meets and bounds, you're not going to find it on the computer system. Uh-huh. You yeah. know, you have to make, like, an appointment, and they may be able to find it for you. Um, but I like some of the, the cities or the counties that are smaller where they give you face-to-face interface, and they sit down with you and show you the books and everything. Well, they they have the big books that are bigger than legal size uh, paper, you know, that even bigger size, and the books weigh like forty pounds or something wow. like, off the shelf, and they're uh, you know they're preserved. But it's just really interesting to they're if, all. If you want to know the county structure, read their either auditor controller dot uh, org. Sometimes they have that, or the CAFR reports. They show you the layout of the county. Okay. Sometimes they, they normally put this, the citizens at the top of the food chain, but that doesn't seem like really where it's going in the courts. If you're a citizen of, let's mm-hmm. say, the county, um, you should be at the top of the food chain. And they even express that on their, their charts, their organizational charts, like Riverside has that citizen at the top. Um, but you've got to accept whatever it is that whoever, like the, um, county executive officers or the board of supervisors, whoever that's at the top of the food chain for the financial office, the county clerk recorder. You know, how many times have we been in the county clerk recorder and they don't want to record anything for us, Judy? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, that, and, that, and that just comes down to do we ever accept their oath and their bonds? Probably not. So we're not really a party to what's going on with their oaths and their bonds, are we? Hmm. It's not good enough just to collect it and say, I accept it. No, you got to put your John Hancock on it and then come and put a net on it, claim back to your state. Very interesting. So these assessors are collecting your state for the manor roll. And Cindy Brewer went into a title company to do a title search on her birth certificate. They knew all about her. They knew she was coming. So they were saying, oh, no, you need a whole team of experts to locate your birth certificate. Mm -hmm. They actually knew. The title company actually are collecting the titles for the estate. Yes. It's it's land. Your, your Your body is a land. I'm planning to I, – actually, I was headed to the title company today when you called me, and uh, I was going to do some uh, – ask some questions there, but I've learned of a new a new term called title plants. Yeah, that's what, Cindy, they apparently that's what get, Cindy brought up, yes. And I've never heard that term before, but I guess they just gather all this information, and then they let people – uh, franchises uh, work as uh, for title, you know, put together title insurance and everything, and they, they have all these records stored somewhere. I don't know where, but we just have to know what the questions to ask the title title company, and I was going to go down and try and see if I could get any uh, bank records, transmittal reports, or anything like that. Yeah, that's a really good one, but I don't want to talk about transmittal report on the air too much because it's a dangerous field to be researching. And if you're 
Oh, yes. Um, I don't want to say how many people died over that information, but a lot have. Okay. Okay. And, you know, th- just stick with your guns. This this mm-hmm. type of stuff that we're digging up here are stuff that we're not supposed to know about. And what Judy is saying about title plant, Cindy Brewer brought this up, the terminology. It just means that they change your name in one record to another. And they, like I said, they could put, let's say, your first, middle, or your middle in an initial, and then your last name. Those could be identified in the bank records. There's some that are actually identifying that name as a beneficiary of a living trust, you see. So it's very interesting once you unearth how they're spelling the name and the title search for the transmittal report will identify a different name that they're collecting your credits. The 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 if it's securitized, then it's the investors that prepay into the fund. They then the banks collect that money. You don't actually have a loan because they took your credits anyways to give you the loan. So that's what the transmittal report is for. Yes. And um, yeah, it's human slavery at its best, I think. Well, I've noticed when I've tried to talk to some of these title companies before, and I'll ask, I'll ask some probing questions. I notice how they just kind of get cool, really cool. They don't like their so their their bonds is on the line, honey. <laughs> you well, know. They're wanting you, me to terminate my visit. You know, I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you know, Judy asks all the right questions. It kind of makes them squirm. You know, but don't be surprised if you're not going to, you know, you hit a couple of walls along the way. You just kind of plug at it because the the implications of this is if they give you the right information, they become liable to the system. <clears throat> mm-hmm. And under H.R. 3474, understand that your estate now belongs to the, the Treasury of the United States that eventually goes into trust funds that eventually get stifled off to England and also the Vatican. So if they go against public policy to not collect on you as a slave, then they could be possibly liable for $250,000, spend 10 years in jail, and lose their license. I don't think anybody wants to do that. But you got to be kind of delicate with the information. <laughs> you know, not get anybody into trouble, per se. Mm-hmm. But thank you so much, Judy, for sharing your story with the, the public. And hopefully, you know, our discussion helps some people if they're endeavoring to get their decedent or their life status corrected and uh, proceed on with their research. Thank you, Judy. Any other final words? No, it's just really interesting. I can't wait to figure out more to do because I like to go out and do things. I don't I like to just study. <laughs> I know. Now she become a doer. She was doing the best research, and she was helping uh, Jean Keating with the transcribing the documents and helping all of us. And mm-hmm. her work is uh, pretty amazing. Is there anything um, as far as services that you provide you to, like as far as collecting books and getting that image? Are you still doing that? Yeah, I, I like to get these old books, and I'm, I'm pulling some really good ones, uh, legal classics. In fact, I got a law dictionary from 1792 that I have been looking at, and it's really interesting to see how it weaves cle- ecclesiastical and, wow. uh, you know, the, into the law. It's, it's white. It, it, these old books are just rich with information. And we are just British subjects yet. We, I mean, that's they're trying to cover that up. We're oh, just yes. connected. We're connected over there. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And, you know, that um, what we wanted to say is that if you need some type of uh, writing services or going to the library to research something, uh, Judy is able to assist with that. And you can contact me through Harmony at gmail.com and I will send her the message to get in touch with you. And I had one more thing I wanted to just tell. I uh you know how our statutes at large are, are listed in, uh, you know, the government records, how they, they call it volume and everything. Well, I've discovered that the ones in England are uh, by way of the king or the queen, you know, George the Third or whatever, and they have a statute number. Well, anyway, these are really, really, really hard to find, and it took me a week to uncover 
22 George the third uh, chapter 46 which was the truce with America Act in 1782 where the king actually gave you know let it gave us freedom and how much of a controversy that whole thing was uh, with the barristers and I anyway I, I finally found it there's some, some old volumes that have these kings and queens statutes and uh, I'm just that was really exciting for me to finally find that that's interesting that you say that because You know, how they got all their power for the state to exist is through a letter's patent. So when you're talking about the king and he's saying, you know, these subjects are free now, um, then that's kind of important, you know, that record so that you can claim it. He did it through letter's patent. And it's right in there. It's less than a page long, this, uh, this uh, this act. And uh, there's just tons of controversy that was written later. Actually, it all leads up to the 1812 war and the uh, original 13th Amendment. It's all a a great story about how they didn't like what the king did, and they were trying to get it all back and everything. So if anybody wants any more on that, I have the statute. It's it's quite quite interesting. Yeah, that's, that's a whole other show. Yeah, that's, that's a whole show. <laughs> that's a whole nother show. That's absolutely right. But thank you so much, Judy, for sharing with us your experience with the IRS and all your research is profound. And I so much appreciate you as a friend and also as a researcher. Thank you. Uh, thanks, thank guys. You. So next, till next time Thursday, we're having the call with Jaguar at two to four p.m. Pacific Standard Time. On Wolf Radio, if you go visit the website, you can click on the Twitter, and then that gives you all the show time and the links to where you can listen and chat with us. Okay, talk to you guys soon. Take care. Bye for now.